Welcome everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our panel discussion about UX methodologies. I bet, you know, as Michaela said, you're curious to discover which methods work and which not always. So my name is Justina Belkovic. I am UX designer, and today I will be the host for the UX methodology panel discussion. And I have my first question to Vanessa, who is a leader, user, researcher at JustEatTakeaway.com. So Vanessa, in your great talk, you mentioned that one of the fundamental principles for building the right product is to make data and user research work together. Could you please expand on how do you make it work for your projects and you know, what are the benefits and challenges of mixing those methods together? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, great question. I think let's start with breaking some misconceptions. I think there's a common idea that data and research functions, especially in, in large organizations, are completely different. Um, but at the end of the day, they're both insights functions, right? And they provide evidence to make better product decisions. So when you're combining the the the, the insights together, you're actually increasing the impact, the potential impact exponentially. Um, and I think to make it work, it starts with bridging this knowledge gap, right? And understanding what each other actually does. So this is where I tell the researchers I work with to start. So what does a researcher do? What is their workflow? How do they share insights? Um, and vice versa, what does a data analyst or data scientist do? How do they work, et cetera? Um, and I think by having that deliberate sharing session, we found it highlighted some natural parts of the process that lend themselves to collaborating within projects. Um, but also it shares knowledge between what is a quantitative method and data and what are those insights and how can we put them into the same presentation to get to the same goal. Um, I think it's, of course, it's not seamless. A common challenge with starting this type of new collaboration is that the way research and data work within organizations can be very different, which makes this ad hoc collaboration kind of tricky. Um, a good place to start is to really figure out what is a problem you're trying to solve, what method makes the most sense, and then bringing in the right experts from the beginning to map out um, when you can bring in the right insights, the right expertise. Um, my final thought on this question is that not every single project needs mixed methods. It's definitely, I think, a bit of a trendy topic in the field lately, and there are, of course, massive benefits. Um, but it's always important to look back at your why question. So what are you trying to understand? What problem are you trying to solve? And then see which method actually makes the most sense. So perhaps just a qualitative research project will be the most logical path forward if you're um, trying to understand the problem space, or maybe just quant is the most appropriate if you're trying to track user behaviors um, and trying to force fit mixed methods might just slow you down. Um, so it's really about choosing the right method for the right problem. Amazing. Thank you so much for this answer, Vanessa. I, I absolutely love this um, advice to step away a little bit and ask this bigger question, you know, as UX designers always try to ask the, the why, why we need that, or why do we need to mix both methods or maybe not. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to ask the following question to Mol, who is the UX design leader at Swedbank. Mol, in your informative talk, you mentioned that user journeys could be a key to successful innovation for cross-functional teams. And could you share with us why user journeys have this unique power to unite people from different groups? Well, you know, when, every, when people are working in a large company, uh, be it a designer or a developer or anywhere else in the company, they only see their uh, the customer from their angle, except, and then uh, they don't see the full picture. They don't see how they contribute on a daily basis. Uh, you know the analogy of this uh, uh, looking at the elephant from different angles and trying to describe it, uh, that type of analogy. The customer journey map helps us all of us to look at uh, the experience from the customer's view, what actually happens with what we have done. And also, if you pair it with the service blueprint, you can directly see how everybody's work is contributing to, to the customer experience on the largest scale. And it's also visual, so people can see, see in live their point 
here is me and oh next to me there is my colleague in in another department let's work together on this etc so this is i think it's the power because it gives the full image from somebody else it's not inside out it's outside in but also the fact that you can make connections just by by seeing uh, different departments working together uh, and even if you didn't think you were doing anything that dealt with customer experience, backend programmer or whatever, um, setting business rules, you are. And this helps you to really understand where that is. Makes sense. I really like the this analogy of the elephant you just shared with. And have you ever experienced any challenges, you know, for, for like people looking at this elephant from different angles who need to like agree that this so this is the elephant and we need to move towards, you know, the, the future, right? Have you ever had this like challenge of people looking at the same thing from different angles? Well, in, in highly collaborative uh, environments, when you're trying to decide what your epic is going to be about and what you're going to do, it is easy to come from your background, your preconceptions, and you try to force your thought in there. And if you don't have a good method at looking at the same thing, the user's uh, view, then uh, then you tend to kind of not meet. You talk about your thing and uh, somebody else talks about the same things, but you don't ever see that this is actually the same point with just different views. So different types of methods that helps us do this. And from my point of view, uh, the customer journey map can also live over time. So it doesn't just live in that moment, in that meeting. It can live for years and years and years. And you keep on talking about it. You get back to it and talk about, it. okay, last uh, half year we had in our strategic work to do this, to support this area. Now let's do that. Or look here, we, this is what we changed. This is what we updated. So we have moved the customer journey map a little bit together. You kind of get the same conversation but also the other thing that it does uh, is that if we ask people to come up with their ideas on what we want to talk to the user about, we can put that up on a hypothesis map and you look at that and say, wow, this is questions we ask the customer, be it by quant or qual. And then we ask these questions and we get answers. And the we there is actually those people who were wondering. So this is a great way to bring everybody into the research work uh, as well so getting this really deep empathy um, emphasizing about what the customer needs is mm -hmm. absolutely great point and i really like that you mentioned that you know maybe at this point of time you look at this journey you see specific challenges but later on let, let it be in half a year or a year you look at it and maybe you see something absolutely different even looking at the mm -hmm. same information so it's, it's, it's really, really great. Fantastic insight. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is to Alina, who is the head of UX research and UX analytics at Allegro. Alina, in your talk, you mentioned that you mentioned the usefulness of small data and big data. And could you please expand on how designers for whom this concept is new can best choose between those two data sets when working on their product? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, yeah, I need to admit that it's a pleasure to be a part of UXDX again and a voice in this panel. So back to the question. Um, mixed methods uh, research involves uh, blending approaches, question types or tools for uncovering insights. So for me, mixing methods means the situation when as you mentioned, <laughs> big data and small data work together to get the actionable uh, insights out of it. To choose the right methods, I organize it into a framework uh, consisting of three stages. So there is a setup that we need to, you know, focus on picking up the, the right method, a plan, and uh, how those methods should work together and then manage. So to choose the right method, so the most important question to answer um, are where I am in the product development process. So is it an exploration, 
uh, where the degree of centrity is, is low, or testing where you check how everything is going, uh, whether it is going with your plan or, or not. So a uh, second question is how deep uh, I need to go down with my research. And then finally, what methods, both qualitative and quantitative, uh, do I have at my disposal? So um, we have big data and small data, and uh, and let be clear, small doesn't mean less important, <laughs> right? Uh, just based on smaller data volume, and uh, the choice between on what Vanessa was uh, talking uh, about in her great presentation, that uh, you need to have your question in mind and uh, solve the problem or understand more. So. So it's about the question. Uh, it's uh, so so the method is secondary, but uh, of course, uh, choosing the right methods it's very important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And you know, I would like to ask Vanessa as well because you have mentioned Vanessa uh, in your answer also about mixing the methods, right, and choosing them. What is your opinion uh, on on what just on what just led? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Alina. I think um, an easy way that I, I like to think about it, um, which is maybe um, simplifying a little bit too much, but um, if we think about small data or qualitative methods, I think about many, many data points, many, many truths um, with fewer people. So you're going really, really deep, you're getting the depth, whereas with quant methods, you're getting lots more data sets um, and a lot more truths. Um, uh, sorry, fewer truths with a lot more people mm -hmm. um, because you're going a bit more shallower, but you're going wider. Absolutely. And and Mal, in your practice, maybe the customer journeys, have you had to like, you know, maybe use it with some other methodologies or, or you think it works better um, with some methodologies than the others? No, I think it's not a methodology, a research methodology per se. You cannot do it without real qualitative research. You cannot do it without quantitative. So it's more a way to gather uh, and remember what you've seen and what you wonder, what you want to learn about. It's more kind of a, an overview method, I'd say, and also a way to try to look at the customer or the user like long term and not only like bits and pieces, but longer term from starting that far away before they even think about our company. So uh, from my point of view, it is a different thing. Uh, you need to have all those methods. You need to do all of those things. But it can help you to select the methods because if you, you can understand what type of questions you have, is it a larger question that you need to understand in depth why this happened? Or is it something that's smaller and you want to know how many have this thing? So that's kind of, it, it can help you a little bit. Makes sense, makes sense. And you have, you know, Mal just um, mentioned about, about the future, right? And, and working with, with uh, this, the customer journeys, right? How do you foresee in the, in the nearest future, future customer journey to change or not? Or what's in this, you know, customer journey process to change? I see, well, in my work, I see that we have more people getting involved. We have people from business. We have people from uh, from advertising, uh, from commerce, commerce, but also people from really deep technology getting into this. So having kind of a more open area and where the whole company can join in and looking at it uh, and I think it depends on the company you're in, where it's going, uh, the maturity. So that's that's one way it will uh, develop for for people to understand that their piece of the cake uh, is not is part of a chain of things, uh, and it can certainly help with uh, commercial launch planning or other things that's not part of product development uh, per se. So that kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Like, you know, the, the more people work on things together, I guess, like the more diverse and innovative the products become. So that's, that's a great prediction for the future. And Alina, what would be your thoughts on, on your methodology, the mixed methods that you have just mentioned? What changes do you foresee in the newest future for, for, for them? 
so I, from a research perspective and, and user experience in general, uh, I see two points. So whichever, uh, whichever way uh, you look at it, uh, the underlying trend is actually clear, increasing sophistication of artificial intelli intelligence and machine algorithms, <laughs> right, uh, are available to assist with both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So we already explore how to capitalize on and incorporate technology, actually augment it, <laughs> right, uh, to the current processes. So using uh, machines to analyze uh, qualitative data could yield time and cost efficiency, as well as enhance the value of the insights derived from, uh, from the data. But uh, the second point, uh, which may appear to opposite to the first, but it's actually not, uh, is a stronger emphasis on uh, the human factor. So when the machines uh, help uh, us optimize the work, we will uh, have more time to show the human in, in the process. Uh, for example, as uh, Smell told us uh, about it, right? Uh, using customer journeys to show the whole story behind. So yeah, so those two points actually uh, for me are clear for C. <laughs> I think they're fascinating, you know, the machine learning and, 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 and AI, as you have mentioned, right? I'm actually very curious, uh, Vanessa, what do you think? I know you have the um, uh, quantitative bag. What is your opinion on, on this prediction that Alina is making? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, um, interesting to build upon that is something that I see for the future of UX is um, a greater focus on ethical and inclusive design and development in general for the field, but especially the role of UX and how it plays. I think that's going to be much more important and commonplace. Um, and I think UX design and research have a hu huge role in understanding and shaping how people consume that technology. And it's becoming much more critical that the way we design and we understand how people interact with tech. Um, especially as we move into more personalization and AI machine learning. Um, I'm starting to hear lots more conversations about researching um, how people experience data privacy or how they want recommendations presented to themselves. I think that's going to be um, really critical. Mm -hmm. So based on your answer right now, do you think that some UX methodologies, they deserve more recognition that they currently have with those changes happening in the future? Mm, I don't know about, about specific methodologies, but I do think there's um, starting to become much more emphasis on doing early stage, deeper ethnography and discovery mm -hmm. research. The word discovery research is becoming much more common, um, even though it's been around for a while. But I think um, we're moving from the era of just doing tactical evaluation, usability tests to really understanding you know, how do people understand things? How, what are their problems? What are their needs? What is the broader context? Um, and then starting to build products and tech around that. Um, so I, I think that's um, an underrated but growing um, approach to research. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I 100% agree with you because in my opinion, more attention should be paid to all tools and methods that expose a human and don't hide the person behind all anonymous uh, numbers. So this we, um, this we uh, can call generally qualitative methods, uh, but you mentioned about ethnography in specific. Um, yeah, as a way of collaboration, collecting feedback and so on. So yeah, totally agree. Amazing. Mol, what, what is your opinion on this? I point? think we're agreeing totally with that. And I think we're moving away from a stage where we perhaps had a customer feedback and, and insights uh, coming in and that them being the truth to now we see them more as signals. This is a signal uh, that something is wrong and that we don't get the user really just yet so that we need to dig deeper and and, uh, and understand and, and I think also our community are moving into earlier stages of business developing of understanding where the business base should be in and understanding where the company can actually support uh, the customer as a human and therefore do much better both good and and, and really a more sustainable business models and such. So we are kind of moving in with the methods earlier and earlier into the thought process of a company. 
Amazing. And Vanessa, maybe you have any thoughts on what just uh, Mal said, you know, understanding the customer better. Do you think there are any other things, any other methods as UX designers or just cross-functional teams we can do to understand uh, the customer better, the user better? Yeah, I think there's lots of things you could do in addition to just pure UX research, right, where you actually speak to customers in a variety of ways. I think going back to our discussion about mixed methods, like even just looking at behavioral data is super insightful, right? You can learn about people's contacts and needs, but also looking at, okay, what do they actually do on your app or platform? Um, and seeing the, the engagement there, I think is um, super useful. Um, but yeah, I think it, it just goes back to understanding what is the, the human behind the screen to Alina's point um, and not just, you know, how are they using the, your, app and how are they clicking on things, but also like, why are they doing that? And what's behind that motivation? And, and maybe it's situational, maybe it's seasonal and, and understanding and pairing those things together. Mm -hmm. So maybe then on the flip side, what do you think Vanessa is going to then vanish from our arsenal as UX designers in the future? I mean, this is what I hope, but I think maybe the idea that research is just talking to customers um, that's what I sincerely hope will vanish. Okay. What about Alina? What do you think? Uh, I would say it will, maybe it wouldn't vanish, but uh, adapt to the new environment. <laughs> I would say like this. Uh, and take advantage. So I uh, think, for example, qualitative methods, like we're talking uh, um, on it. Uh, so the point is uh, not that they will be replaced by machines, like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. but uh, that they will be, um, they will coexist uh, with, with machines, maybe as a peer, um, maybe, you know, you can think about predictive algorithm or uh, simply uh, speech recognition. So um, machines work alongside people. Yeah, that, that's my imagination. <laughs> right. and, and is it is it like a, a future you would like to be part of or does it scare you? you know, like when of course. You... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are scared and some people are looking with uh, an enthusiasm, right, uh, in, in the future. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the, the, the second, the latter group that uh, is looking uh, for advantage and uh, that, that we can use machines for our own, you know, sake. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing. So you are embracing that, right? Yes, nice. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So yeah, stay and calm. I think it's a <laughs> process of design and research, right? Like already you're seeing a lot of like automatic recruitment tools and ways yeah. of doing transcription that's run through machine learning. So I think the speed to which we can do UX will change as well with the help of augmented tech and um, machine learning. And I think that's really exciting. Amazing. Mol, what is your opinion on that? You have so much experience, you know, so what's... Okay. what's yeah. Going back to what Vanessa said, is this is more my hope, but I also think so. I think that with coming into these methods that we have talked about today, the customer journey and the mixed methods, we will get rid of these... Um, I heard a customer say, and I think this means, think means, I would like to not hear that anything anymore. I'd like to actually uh, everybody understand that it is possible to understand why customers are doing certain things. It is possible if we use the right methods at the right things, times. And, and, and if we used uh, the people who are skilled at it to their ability uh, and, and to really take care of that, and it's not part. It's not a separate part of, of the company. It's just infused in everything that we do uh, in, in larger companies as well. Mm -hmm. So this kind of infusing it into everybody's work, rather as having it as a special island doing customer research or user research. Mm -hmm. Thank. You. Yeah, I think it's a good point because uh, so now I think we use machines as a tool. So machines uh, precisely follow human instructions, right? So yeah. like we want to, to recruit someone. Uh, so then we use machines as a tool. Uh, but uh, I can see, I can predict or it even it's happening right now that uh, human will assist us and then will be appear 
for us. So, uh, so it's going to change. Like, I mean, the the coexist the coexisting, right? Absolutely. Vanessa, any, any thoughts uh, from you on that coexisting with the machines? Not us maybe necessarily telling them what to do, <laughs> but us together deciding what to do. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, the focus on, you know, AI machine learning is just the beginning. And I think there's going to be a greater focus on what are the human specialties that we have, like whether that's creativity or, you know, understanding each other, getting context, um, and then pairing that, right? And I think uh, that the the range of things that we're going to automate and and give off to to machines or other technologies is going to change and it's probably beyond our imagination right I think back where we were 10 years ago so it's hard to speculate now but I think things are definitely going to change and it comes back to what you what was talked about earlier the ethical design uh, we need to have a focus on that everything we do deals with ethics, all the questions we ask, all the screening we do, uh, everything that we want to know. It, it comes back to, to the ethics of, the, uh, of what we're doing. And we have such big powers in, in our roles as well. And we should take them seriously because we are, go we are teaching the machines and we are teaching, uh, we're kind of steering this as well. So I think we have a lot of, responsibility as well absolutely absolutely fantastic topic i i can't wait to live in a future like this you know sounds fascinating i have a couple of questions from the audience um so maybe let's let's answer this one uh mol i'll direct it to you so mol how do you manage trying to implement new methodologies working for traditional organizations well like sweat bank in your case I, it's it's about being opportunistic. It's about finding your the people who may come in from outside and who wants to do the same thing as you, and just do it. Um, do it. Work in well, all big large corporations. They often have a spark of wanting to do new things, and it's usually easier to do it in a smaller setting with one project in one team and then you do it and then you have great success and then it can spread to others so it's basically finding your friends and finding your your hero projects but make it small enough so that you can actually get success and it's not taking two years or whatever you need to have uh, wins quite soon um, yeah that kind of thing Amazing. I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, I have a, another question from the audience and I'll direct it to Vanessa and Alina. Uh, what would you like people to think of when they think of research and the caveat, not just talking to users? So I guess like the, the, the audience question is about like, what would you like people to think when you're mentioning the research? Okay, so my first thought is that uh, research is a tool a tool that help uh, to make uh, better decisions and to lower the risk. So this is what I would like people to, to think when, uh, when uh, we work together, that I'm not here to do research. I'm here to help them to facilitate the decision-making process. So uh, it's not about data, it's about knowledge. Fantastic. Yeah, wow. absolutely agree. You know, it's not just about the methods, right? That's kind of the least important part of the job. It's about making better decisions. It's about providing evidence, creating new opportunities, um, and the, the impact that you can have. Um, and I think the second thing that I think of is, is research is inherently based on social science research. It's based on a long history of academia and the scientific method and the expertise needed to do UX research really well. Um, is really hard and I think it should be highlighted um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the field develops and the creativity with which new methods will be developed. 
you know, I overheard Christopher from uh, the previous session, and he said, "Don't tell people that you're uh, going. What are you going to do? But do it and show them the results, right?" So, uh, I'm thinking of research like, like this that says, "Don't tell your stakeholders that you about the methodology or you know other stuff that." They don't care, actually. <laughs> they do care what uh, the impact, what, what the value uh, it will bring uh, to them, right? Amazing, yeah. absolutely. Mol, do you have any questions? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do you, want, do you have any opinions uh, on this topic as well? No, but I, I totally agree on, on this, just, just doing things, but also finding a way to, at the same time, talk about the fact that this is an occupation that we're, that it requires a skill it's not it's not that easy you need to really uh, have uh, both a knowledge uh, and also just do it what we can share with others what can be taken in is the actual the point of view the empathy of actually not putting yourselves in somebody else's shoes being curious and being love being wrong and that is that's the kind of mindset you can kind of spread to the organization and you don't have to tell them that it's a method or whatever, but it's really about be loving wrong uh, about your pre preconceptions. Yeah, Mal, you're making me think of like the, I think the most underrated part of being a researcher, which is interpretation and facilitation, right? People yeah. always talk about methods and researching and talking to customers, but so much of being a researcher is um, facilitating with your product team and interpreting insights to make sure that the product team understands it in the right way. And I think that's um, a huge part of research that doesn't get talked about enough. And it's a tough skill. It's really difficult to do that. And you have to have experience so to be able to, to do it well, and it should be acknowledged. Absolutely. I agree with everything you have said. You know, it's uh, being a researcher or researcher in general it's not just fun and games talking to the users you know bonding but it's much more than that absolutely agree so we're just right on time so thank you so much for this fantastic discussion i've discovered so many new topics so many new ideas i hope you did too so i give it back to michaela thank you so much everyone